Learn more about why Duluth has become a major hub of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation in Minnesota, what we're doing to prevent trafficking and help people who've been trafficked and exploited recover, and what you need to know to help your children stay safe, next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. On Monday, Mayor Emily Larson and others kicked off the fifth annual Human Trafficking Awareness Month here in Duluth. Tonight, we're going to continue that conversation to increase awareness, not just about the fact that sex trafficking exists here in our community, but to also create an awareness of how trafficking affects victim survivors, what we can do to prevent and eliminate trafficking, and what is available here in the Northland to help victim survivors of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation <laughs> recover. As you can see, this is a mature topic that may not be appropriate for all viewers, so use your best judgment, look around the room, make sure that who's in the room should be in the room. Our phone lines are open for your questions now locally. Dial 218-788-2844 or call toll-free at 1-877-307-8762. We'll be answering your questions throughout tonight's show. Joining me is Sanu Sresta, the Trafficking Program Coordinator at the Program for Aid to Victims of Sexual Assault, better known to our community as PAVSA. Thank you so much for being here. It's been three years since you've been on our show, and actually a lot has happened in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in this area. And I think always a really good place for us to start, Sanu, is for you to describe for our viewing audience what actually sex trafficking is, what that means. Of course, um, thank you very much for having us. Um, so sexual exploitation is, um, as defined in the law, when a person under the age of 18 is found to be engaged in any sort of commercial sexual act in exchange of something of value. And that value can be anything. That can be a shelter, uh, a, a night stay, food, drugs, or any other kind of things of value, then that person is defined as a victim of sexual exploitation. As opposed to sexual exploitation, sex trafficking is a rather rigid uh, term, and uh, it's rather narrow in that you have to prove that there's somebody else who is benefiting from that trade, who's in, 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 uh, in short, somebody who is pimping you out. So that's the major difference between sex, sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And you referenced that, um, uh, made reference to that in terms mm -hmm. of youth, though in, in, my, in my own mind, I feel like adults can be exploited, vulnerable, certainly vulnerable adults and women, um, as well as, as young men um, can be exploited as well. Tell me a little bit about the difference um, mm -hmm. with that. Um, of course, yes, um, and even though the law does not recognize in theory that adults can be victims of sexual exploitation um, unless they can prove that somebody else is profiting off of them, then they are victims of sex trafficking. But here in Duluth, the Duluth Trafficking Task Force with its, with its uh, 40 plus agencies participating in the task force actually recognizes that adults can be vulnerable to be sexually exploited. Um, and especially when you look at the demographic of people who are victims, um, they are lured or forced or pushed or uh, pulled into prostitution when they are 12, 13. So for the rest of their, rest of their lives, if they are in that sort of situation, there's no way we can not see that that person when becomes an adult is not a victim. And that's, that's an incredible age. I think that um, our viewing audience, mm -hmm. 12 or 13 years old, that's awfully young. Talk a little bit about how a 12 or 13 year old um, might get pulled into uh, being exploited sexually. Um, sure, yeah, so um, from our own experience working with victims, a lot of the time um, this 
victims have prior history of sexual abuse, uh, childhood sexual abuse, again, uh, sexual assault, domestic violence, family violence at the home. Uh, they are runaways, they are uh, thrown away from their houses, have a lot of other uh, issues like uh, chemical dependency issues or even uh, uh, behavior issues. So these kids are already at risk of being preyed by predators in the community. And the pimps and traffickers, they are very, very uh, smart and know how to spot those signs in those kids. So they, when they approach a kid who is 12, 14 at a mall and tell them how pretty they look, that they'll buy all these different things and that she looks in, and I'm using she casually here, again, boys can be trafficked as well, that she looks very pretty, that she seems in distress, that he'll help her, help her out with whatever she needs she will tend to fall for that because obviously she's running away from so many different things. She's not running away to a trafficker, she's running away from all the abuses and all the issues that's happening in her life. But unfortunately, she gets preyed by the predator who is uh, or who knows that what he wanted to do with her. And one of the things that we, we know too is that um, you don't have to be mean or threaten violence in order um, to get kids then the flattery and the promise of gifts or the promise of, mm -hmm. of safety or the promise of shelter or the promise of nice things um, is enough, uh, can be enough of a lure. Am, am, I, am I right about that, Sue? Absolutely, um, and that's how it usually starts in the beginning, this, that, that is where the, that is where that initiating phase. So once they have developed some kind of rap report or the relationship with the victim as boyfriend or as a friend or as somebody who is taking care of them, they first want to gain their trust. And after that trust is built between the pimp or the boyfriend or the victim, then later on, six months, seven months down the road, then the, vic the, uh, the pimp will start to manipulate her in many different ways whether that be emotional manipulation, psychological torture, financial abuse, uh, or, or even uh, threatening her. And, and that comes in, to so that manifests in so many different ways. So yes, in, in the beginning, it may seem like he's a really nice guy and it just wanting to help her uh, and, and, will, and will say that he'll provide all these things to her. Now, we have a question already from a caller in Duluth who asks, are there particular populations who are at risk for being trafficked? Oh, yes. Um, like I said, again, um, uh, kids, because they are kids, mm -hmm. um, they are at a very high risk of being trafficked and sexually exploited. Uh, homeless youth, um, they are at a very high risk of being sexually exploited. Um, youth from LGBTQ community, um, youth of color, um, youth uh, who are uh, in poverty, youth who have family violence at home, um, youth who have other different kind of issues at home. And again, uh, 70 to 90 percent of the time, uh, even adults who are in prostitution have had multiple uh, history of sexual abuse or sexual assault. So all of those factors combined put that person at so much high risk of being sexually exploited and sex trafficked. And if you think about some of these adults, so much of their life then has been, that's all they've known then yep. as, as, as well. Talk about how um, that lengthy period of time, because um, wh or maybe that, that's a, a great question, which is um, how long does the typical survivor victim um, s uh, stay in a sexually exploitive um, situation? It's really hard to tell um, because sometimes it could be, and it really depends uh, uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. Some people, uh, some women have stayed there for their entire lifetime until they were killed or until they died, right? Um, that's a very, very sad and disheartening situation. But then there are people who have received services, who had received people who reached out to them and offer services in time so they could get out of that uh, sort of exploitative situation. So to be exact, it's, it's, it's kind of a difficult 
uh, it, that's why we uh, emphasize so much on providing services and so much on uh, uh, bringing education and awareness to every members in the community so we know and know that if there are victims out there, we can all go out and tell these victims that there are resources, that there, there are help, not enough, but there are at least some help out in the community that they can access to. So if they want to live that kind of lifestyle, they, that they can. What, uh, talk a little bit now about just what's changed in the last three years about the resources that are available to victim survivors. Um, yeah, since 2013, the law, Safe Harbor, Safe Harbor uh, for Youth Act, uh, uh, has uh, gone into full effect since August of 2014. With that, we have received money uh, uh, through the legislature to provide housing, to provide supportive services, to house regional navigators throughout the state of Minnesota, and to provide training to professionals and law, enforce law enforcement in general. And explain a little bit for our viewing audience who may not be familiar with that law about what that law has done then. Yeah, so safe Harbor, like I uh, explained in the beginning, is a uh, Sexual Exploitation Youth Act, which defines children who are found to be involved in prostitution or any other kind of commercial sexual act are victims rather than criminals. Earlier, kids were uh, prosecuted as delinquents or teen prostitutes before the Safe Harbor Law came into being. Although we did have a sex trafficking law, um, the law was kind of uh, uh, not very clear as to how uh, they would or would not define kids who were trapped into this kind of exploitative situation. But with Safe Harbor Law, that kind of cleared that confusion, especially with the sex trafficking law. So uh, now the kids are not prosecuted are not viewed as victims but rather uh, are, are viewed as criminals. as criminals but rather as victims and are hence uh, 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 hence directed to receive different kinds of services uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. Right, rather than being adjudicated yep. as a juvenile delinquent, mm -hmm. they're now um, being um, turned in focus towards uh, treatment services, I, w I, I, I would yep. imagine. Um, and that tr treatment services look, uh, the services look very different to very different people. For some, that can uh, be a uh, 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 very intense therapy. For some, that can just be a long-term advocacy. For some, that can just be one-time uh, crisis counseling with an advocate um, and, and can mean providing basic services, uh, meaning basic needs or housing. So it looks very different to different people. Um, but yes, they have wide wide uh, range of needs, um, which we, all the organizations providing services to youth who are at risk of exploitation or sex trafficking are working very hard to provide our s services from that holistic approach. And there's even a uh, specialized housing kind of within the LifeHouse organization, right? Yeah, um, and yeah. tell us a little bit about that because I just think, that, I don't think that was in existence when you were here last time or it no. was, and so that's really a beautiful thing since homelessness is so much of often a part of um, victims of sexual exploitation. Um, yeah, so it, it is a huge progress, especially like you said, um, w when uh, kids run away most of the time, homelessness is a crucial factor that they have to succumb to the um, sort of uh, quote-unquote activities because they don't have any other options. So uh, LifeHouse has uh, received funding again through that Safe Harbor uh, uh, fund to uh, house five beds um, and they call it Soul House. Mm -hmm. So these five beds transitional housing is again open to uh, youth from six to from 16 to 17, and they can stay there for about two years. It's a transitional program. They do have other different kinds of programming. In the house, it is not a locked facility, but a secure facility. So they do have case managers, advocates, and other different kind of programs in the house and at Life House so that the kids can successfully complete quote unquote the program and lead a successful life. Likewise at PAVSA we have a, a Northeast Safe Harbor Regional Navigator. So this person oversees seven counties here in Northeast Minnesota. Um, this person is the primary contact person for anybody here in uh, seven counties in Northeast, um, be that uh, a case management for a victim, be that training professionals, be that helping other community come up with their own multi 
multidisciplinary team are helping other uh, counties or communities develop protocol in working with trafficking or sexually exploited youth. So that's again a wonderful uh, uh, accomplishment for our community where we can go to one person and get it's, it's a one stop where we can get all our, hopefully all our um, uh, the questions answered. It, and so, it, it um, correct me if I'm wrong, then PAPS has really been a leader, not just in our community here, but in our larger community of the Northland and in, in Minnesota in terms of training other professionals and helping other communities um, with their awareness programs and maybe with their law enforcement programs uh, and to have that sort of same coming together of multi-agency collaboration as we have had here. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. And PAFSA has a long history of working collaboratively with uh, non-profits or service providers here in town and law enforcement and criminal justice uh, systems that has helped tremendously with this issue as well. Um, hadn't it been for all the work that PAVSA and other organizations have done in the past, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been possible for us to come could come together rather quickly to, uh, uh, to accomplish some of these big goals that we had set um, in 2008-2010. So um, here's a, a caller from uh, Duluth, a woman who wants to know what are we doing um, to uh, deal with the, the perpetrators, and is that a focus at all of mm. the um, of the task force or of of the community who is coming together to address sex trafficking? Is um, what to do with the perpetrators? Um, yeah, that's um, that's again um, one focus of. Uh, uh, addressing the demand, addressing how to end the demand, right? Um, but again, we can't, all of us can't really go after pimps and traffickers. Mm -hmm. So we have partnership with law enforcement and Duluth Police Department. It's working very dil diligently to address this issue. Um, they have new initiatives to, again, expand their reach so they can find all these pimps and traffickers in the community. Um, especially the Duluth Trafficking Task Force, since it's a, uh, it's a volunteer, multidisciplinary team of people, uh, we um, can't really uh, aim to go after pimps, but again, the education, we want to make sure that people are getting the education that buying and selling of children is basically a crime, that it's a human rights violation, that it's an it's a issue of public health in, in our community, and that we all should be aware of it and, 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 and uh, come to address it as a community. Um, so that's what we do from our end, but we definitely work with law enforcement and crimin criminal justice systems very closely in tackling that. I like what you said about ending the demand, and that kind of raises a question of, what is the link between uh, things like strip clubs, and pornography, and uh, sexual s sexual exploitation and sex trafficking? Um, well, stripping, exotic dancing, pornography. Um, because we have that in our community, and so we should know this. We should know the link between this. And so here you go. Here's the answer to this question. Uh, oh yes, absolutely. There is uh, there is a direct link to it. Uh, most of the time, again, uh, people don't think that if it, if they go to a strip club that they are. Uh, uh, participating in that uh, sexual exploitation or sex trafficking industry, but they, but a lot of the time, even from our own experience working with victims, it's a gateway to prostitution, where women and girls and children and boys are being exploited by pimps, are being managed, quote unquote, managed by pimps, um, are 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 being uh, abused and threatened. Um, and, and bear all, all the sort of physical and sexual violence from the pimps. So yes, again, we, we see um, that there is a direct uh, relationship between stripping, uh, exotic dancing, and uh, sexual exploitation. In fact, especially for kids under the age of 18, that is sexual exploitation. If somebody who is 17 mm -hmm. and is stripping, that person is defined as sexual exploitation. Um, but for adults, although it it may, to many of us, uh, seem like that's a legal uh, uh, legal work and is legally allowed. There is still a direct connection between sexual exploitation and stripping. And I think many women who um, are involved involved um, in in the sex industry, if they could make 
the same amount of money doing something else or, or um, they would choose something else, that that's not necessarily a, a free choice that they're making. You make a really good point that it is not a free choice. I think sometimes when we talk about choice, um, we tend to think no matter what kind of uh, option that you choose, that that is a choice, no matter if no matter whether that's a good choice or a bad choice. But we have to think about the power dynamics and who is benefiting off of that choice and how much women are really making by, make, by uh, again, choosing that choice, right? Choosing that option. Um, and most of the time, women who are in prostitution or are being sexually exploited are not making a lot of money. They are barely passing by, and they they, are, they do it, they choose it because they don't have any other option. Um, it's not like they are making millions of dollars and they are really enjoying the work that they do. Um, that's why we 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 say the Dulu Trafficking Task Force um, we name prostitution or we define prostitution as sexual violence against women. That it's not a uh, it's it's not a, a profession. It should not be uh, an econo economic alternative for women. And so, um, if we're end, if we're working to ending the demand, what is the implications of this then about how we're raising boys um, or uh, anybody else who is uh, purchasers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and that's that's again an excellent point. How are we raising our boys? How are we um, talking with our uh, men in our family? Right. Um, sometimes we think, okay, um, it's. This is that's just a joke, right? That's just a, that's just a joke that does not have any implication. But we do not think about what kind of implication does that have socially um, in our society? How that fits into the uh, uh, the objectification of women and sexualization of women and children, and how that again fits into this culture of normalizing sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. The um, there there's a caller who called in saying. Um, uh, are, are there pimps hanging out at Miller Hill Mall? Is it safe? And, and this is the question that, that I got in, and, you know, so please no calls from Miller Hill Mall. But, but I think this raises the, the question of are there safe places and are there, you know, are there places that where my kids are guaranteed to be safe, public places where I'm allowing my children to go, where there's guaranteed safety, um, and are there places that are not as safe? Um, yeah, I, I think when, when we talk about physical spaces, we tend to, uh, uh, again, some of these examples, right, mall, the schools, uh, public parks, are these safe spaces. It's rather easy to talk about are these spaces safe or not, and not really think about whether the internet is safe. What we have seen is that there is uh, an increase in children being recruited through different kind of social media. Backpage just recently shut down, uh, Craigslist shut down a few years ago, but there are still many sites out there where uh, children are hanging out and we do not know who they are hanging out with and we do not know what kind of uh, conversation they are, that they are participating in, what kind of activities that they are engaging uh, in. Um, so internet, I say, is the most unsafe place for so youth. So what are the implications then for, parent, for parents who are listening in terms of keeping, being able to keep their children safe? Uh, what should they be doing? I think the first thing is uh, having open communication with your kid. Sometimes um, we, um, and, and everybody's uh, parent, parenting style is so different, but it always helps when you leave that door open, the communication open, and letting your kids know that no matter what, that they have their support, believing your kids. I think most of the time what we see, even at our organization PAVSA, is uh, parents not believing when they tell, uh, when, when their kids tell parents that they've been uh, sexually assaulted, right? So it, it starts there, believing your kids um, when they report something of that nature. And then also talking about healthy relationship, um, unhealthy relationship, boundaries, all these things that sometimes we take for granted, uh, meaning that we think that they should just know it, um, but they don't know or it. Or don't need to know it. Yep, exactly, or don't need to know it. Um, so I think those are some of the basic things that we can start doing. And again, how are we raising our girls and how are we raising our boys? Um, to this date, most of the parents, we tell girls to be girls and boys to be boys, right? Girls, pay, girls play with Barbie and boys play with trucks. 
let's give our girls trucks to play with, right? And let's not um, penalize boys when they play with dolls. Um, but blurring those gender lines, I think that's very important. And, and teaching boys to respect women, teaching boys to see girls as a human being first um, and not a sexual object. I think that's very, very important. I think that is a wonderful message of hope to end this on, um, really teaching teaching boys and the men in our community and um, higher offices to respect women. I think that is a worthy message for all of us. I think the other message of hope is, wow, have we come a, f a long way uh, in three years. There's still more to do. Pavsa, uh, Sanu was telling me, now has four full-time four full-time members working on staff um, for victim survivors of sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. When they were here three years ago, there was just Sanu. So um, three cheers to Pavsa for helping us understand the problem and helping us address the problem. Thank you so much and thanks to all of the other organizations that have combined uh, for this wonderful collaboration for our community. Thanks to you for joining the discussion tonight and don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the power of apology. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night. <music>